I have a question for you, Joel. As you were talking, you mentioned the Lord's Prayer and you said on earth as it is in heaven. And we've had conversations about, you know, new heaven, new earth. <laughs> like for someone who maybe is like newer to that like concept, like what is new earth? Like what is that? What exactly does that mean? Can you unpack that a little bit more? A yeah. Question? Yeah. Well, here's here's my first question. I, I'm going to I'm going to do the good rabbi thing, right? Like uh, <laughs> ask a question, respond to the question. So um, when you think of heaven, what do you think of? Mm-hmm. Like what's your what's your mental picture? Like not with many years of studying with us yeah, together, but, yeah, yeah. but like yeah. you know what I mean. Like yeah. like growing up, like you're in a junior high, high school kid. The first time mm-hmm. you kind of hear uh, about heaven, what would be like that first? I picture? mean, I think of all the paintings that are in like old churches or even just like story books, you know, that are very like angelic yes. and lots of light, lots mm-hmm. of singing, yeah. you know, just. Like, uh-huh. it's just a very, it seems like a very happy, like, party, honestly. Mm-hmm. And everyone kind of looks like angels. Yeah. yeah. Very ethereal. Yes. Not, like, physical. Yeah, not yeah. tangible at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I feel like you're going to get to. Yeah. It's, like, yeah. Yeah. an important point. But, yeah, I, yeah. everything you said, yeah. like, totally, that's what pops yeah. into my head. Okay. L- look at the book end of um, the Bible. Uh, we start in a literal physical garden. Mm-hmm. It's the place where God and humanity meet. Um, and then in Revelation 21 and 22, it's like, um, oh, the garden comes back. And now it's no longer a garden. It's a city, mm. right? And where is the city? The city seems to be on the new, in the new heavens, the new earth. So the language of scripture is new heavens and new earth. And there has been, I'm not quite sure when, I'm sure somebody has written some book or dissertation or something about like, when did we get to this ethereal, cloudy, we're all angels floating in wings? Like, when did that happen? I'm not quite sure, but I'll just let y'all know, like as kindly and compassionately as I can, that ain't it, sis. (laughs) Like, that's not the picture. Yeah. The picture is, I think a closer picture is Eden. Um, And the thought that, and I call this an escapist theology, Mm -hmm. The thought that we escape out somewhere and leave this bad, horrible earth away um, is like antithetical to scripture. That's not the presentation of what scripture has. In fact, I think, uh, we are talking about this earlier, Victoria, I think that C.S. Lewis describes what the new heavens and new earth will look like the best, the very ending scene of the last battle. And it's this picture of all of these things that are fading away, but also being transformed and becoming new with still the very presence of what they were. And the things that faded away were the things that were corrupted by sin that were unredeemable, Mm -hmm. right? Those things are gone. But the things that were good, the things that are beautiful and yet still broken because of sin, in this beautiful way, in the new heavens, the new earth, these things are redeemed and they're restored and they're almost made like, they are made brand new, but you don't forget the context of which you experienced that goodness originally, you know? Mm-hmm. And so this is what the new heavens and the new earth are. It's not a uh, disembodied, angelic-like, spiritualized deal. It is embodied. Like Jesus in the incarnation was embodied. Like he let you touch his hands. He let you mm-hmm. touch the sun. He was eating on a beach. Like that is the picture of what the new heavens, the new earth are. And I think that's actually incredibly important for this conversation of exile. Because when we think about exile, it's like, do we just endure? Mm-hmm. Like, are we just here? And like, we just got to like survive till we get out of here. But if we think about the beauty and how that beauty is going to be redeemed and restored, it actually puts weight, value and worth to the things that we're doing right now, you know, to be like good stewards of God's creation here on earth right now, that thing is going to actually make an impact into eternity. I'm glad that you asked that question because I think if there are listeners, which I'm sure there are on the other side of, uh, on the other side of this conversation today, they're listening to this and they've never heard what you just talked about. You know, Um, I hope that that breaks a lot of fear that I think sometimes can be around like the afterlife. And, you know, we don't have time to get into all that today, but I'm glad that you kind of dispelled like where we've very much departed (laughs) and gone um, from this. So, Victoria, I know that you've done a lot of studying on this topic of exile and even just asking about the new heavens and the new earth. And so I want to give you the floor to share anything that that you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for um, yeah diving into that, Joel. I feel like. I so I definitely was in the like angels floating around 
sort of like camp of what I thought. That was the era we grew up <laughs> yeah, in of Sunday truly, school for sure. Truly, truly, yeah. Um, whether that was like the intention or not, that's like what my takeaway was. Um, but over the last like five, ten years, I really keep coming back to this, you know, the new earth like sort of concept and like, mm-hmm. okay, what does that mean for me today? Um, because I, yeah, I feel like things can feel, you know, we've talked about things here that's very 30,000 feet and I'm kind of, we're kind of in the like 15,000 feet, you know, area right now and we're going to get to the ground level to make it a little bit more practical. Um, so yeah, I just, that concept of what we do here on earth in this life and how it really matters, um, has become so important to me and to your point, Shay, like taking away fear, that I have and also given me so much freedom because I think um, I think we as believers can make God so small and put him in a box, um, but he is so limitlessly creative and um, there's this such vision of all the different ways that um, he's created our world and our earth that we just don't even think about. And so for me, whenever I'm thinking about this, concept I and I'm thinking about like okay so what I do here on earth really matters so what does that mean well I think there's so many different ways that we can work whether that's paid or unpaid um, here on this earth that is an act of worship to the Lord Mm -hmm. and so that act of worship to the Lord you know Joel when you were talking about the things that will fade away or pass away those things that are done on this earth that are an act of worship to the Lord will stay and maybe they'll be transformed because they're not, you know, there's still brokenness there, um, but they will remain and be an echo in eternity. So that could look like um, a beautiful piece of art Mm. that is created here. That, that is literally us. Like the Lord is a creator and that is us as humans how we were wired, how the Lord created us to mirror his creation as our creator. Um, So yeah, a beautiful piece of art. Maybe it's um, packing a healthy lunch for your kids to go to school so it fills up their bellies with good food. And so their brains are ready to absorb the information that they need to get at school. Or maybe it's you faithfully doing your work in a cubicle in some sort of financial office where that industry would be really easy to fall prey to greed or climbing a social ladder uh, or, you know, um, um, climbing the corporate ladder for a yeah. corporate ladder. Thank you. Um, chasing prestige. You know, there's so many different ways that we can do our work in a way that's worshiped the Lord. And those are the things that will be present on the new earth. And I think that's really cool. And actually, um, Tolkien wrote, a sh- uh, J.R. Tolkien wrote a short story that I think illustrates this in a really cool way. Um, the main character of the short story is a painter, and he has this vision in his mind of this beautiful tree that he wants to paint, um, all the colors and textures, and he just, he that is what he wants to do. He's an artist. He wants to paint this beautiful tree. And every time he goes to paint, to you know, he's at his canvas, every time he goes to paint, um, something comes up. There's a neighbor who comes by and he um, he needs help. So the main character has to go and help him. Or there's a storm coming and he needs to um, repair his roof and, you know, um, board up the windows because the storm is coming. So he has to go spend time doing that. And he only has time to paint one leaf on this big, beautiful tree. This whole vision that he has, he only gets one leaf done before someone comes to him and he has to go on the long trip, which AKA means he's dying. Um, <laughs> this, it's a metaphor, but you know, so he goes on this long trip. He's not able to finish his leaf or his tree. He just gets the leaf done. But what happens when he arrives in his destination after the long journey is he walks into this big, beautiful field and there's his tree physically there. The tree that he had always imagined in his mind is there uh, waiting for him after in his, you know, in this scenario of eternity. And I just think that's such a beautiful reminder of how what we do here really and truly does matter. Um, and I always think, I try to think of that and remember that whenever I, you know, I'm just toiling about on this earth and I'm like, oh, 
is this does this have purpose like what is the purpose of folding this laundry or like planting this garden Mm -hmm. in you know my backyard or whatever you know yeah everything can be seen as an act of worship like I think about uh, old people that I'll encounter and you'll say like how are you they're like oh I'm I'm just passing through, you mm-hmm. know, and it's like, mm-hmm. well, there's some truth to that like we're not here forever. Like we are not um, stuck here to just wait until it's our time to go to heaven. Like God has asked us and given us opportunities to bring mm-hmm. his presence or to show his presence to the world. Yeah. Are these different acts of worship that you're talking about. Yeah. I, I love that story because I think even, you know, the way that Tolkien works often is he's given us this story, these illustrations, and they're meant to almost be flexed, you know, a bit and to let our imagination run with it. And even as uh, I've heard you share the story before, Victoria, but even just now as you're saying it, some new things came up where I was just thinking like, okay, um, there's a difference between vocation and calling, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, there's this vocation which can shift and change over seasons and times. But then there's like calling. And, and for me, I even separate calling between capital C calling and lower C calling. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, I think the calling of every believer of Jesus is that Second Corinthians 5 to make the presence of Jesus to be ambassadors of Christ. And he's making his appeal in and through us. And then the, the lower C calling is just a bit more individualized to us. And I would um, connect the lower C calling with the gifts of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. You know, God gives us gifts and these gifts are meant for the edification of God's people and the glorification of God himself. And just as an exercise, if you're uh, going out with your girlfriends and you're going to sit down and hang out and talk, like one of the best things that you might do with them is like go to, um, you know, uh, Galatians 5 and, and look at the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the different passages, and maybe ask a friend and say, hey, what gifts do you see in me? Mm-hmm. You know, and allow them to speak into you. And then what you'll find is that this calling will often be able to be flexed out vocationally in what you're doing. Now, the vocation can change in various and seasons. And it often does. And it often yeah. does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what confidence and what like comfort to know that even if your vocation is flexing and changing in places that you maybe didn't even want it to change in, yeah. the calling remains consistent. And with this story, I just think about drawing that leaf. I'm like, man, I wonder what, how this guy would feel like. Um, you know, for me, it'd be like, writing a chapter of some something and never yeah. can finish the entire book, you know? And like, what would happen? And I'm like, well, and I think this is maybe what Tolkien is getting at is every act, everything that he was distra- quote unquote distracted with right. was actually a participation of the fulfillment of that um, tree, right? Yeah. Even though he didn't get to physically draw it out in a way he was living it out. And so when he gets to the new heavens and the new earth, he sees the tree and then we get to like, for us today, we get to see Oh, just because we have a view of how this can get done in the economy of God's kingdom, man, he is like what you said, Victoria, endlessly creative. And so that very vision can actually happen through a variety of means. Obedience and faithfulness is the goal. 